Hello and welcome to the Legal and General Just Covered podcast. Today we've got another one of our specials where we're listening to advisors' news and views around different types of the intermediary space. And today we're looking at later life lending. My name's Wayne. And I'm Hazel and we're really excited to have a little look at the later life lending space and how advisors can really enhance their skills in that area. And to help us do that, we are joined today by Mike, who is an advisor for Mewstone Later Life. So welcome, Mike. Thanks for coming. No worries. Thank you. Yeah. So do you want to start us off just by telling us a little bit about your journey as an advisor and how you yeah. really got into the later life space? Yeah. So my background really is retail banking. So I kind of started, funnily enough, on the way in, I was talking to uh, to Joe, who I've come with today, um, about my journey and how I started. So I started 15, 16 odd years ago now, working as a cashier in a building society um, and kind of worked my way through um, the bank in loads of different positions over the years and eventually kind of ended up at, at mortgage advice. And when I worked in the building society, um, because it was still that kind of time where you'd go in, you'd sit down, you'd speak to your, you know, your advisor. Um, I, I, I kind of learned quite quickly that actually I really enjoyed talking to older clients um, because sometimes you're literally the only person they've seen all day, so you can sit down and have a nice chat and, and you know, and, and just kind of watch well go by. So when I moved into mortgages, I kind of lost that a little bit. It became quite transactional, um, and I wanted a change. And I decided to move into the world of kind of later life mortgages, so dealing with borrowers over the age of 50 who need some type of borrowing. Um, so I joined a, a brokerage in 2019 um, who specialised in later life lending, spent three or four years there, um, became equity release qualified whilst I was there, and then decided to sort of take it a step further and, and join Mewstone, who were looking to build a later life lending arm of their business. Um, and so I started there just at the start of this year. Um, so I've kind of gone on this journey of working from like, you know, cashier in the bank, done more or less all of the stuff that you could have done there before I moved into the kind of the, the dark side, the vocal world. Um, and then, yeah, now I've, uh, now I've gone to Mewstone. I can't, couldn't agree with you more. So my background's really similar. I was is a it? building society background as well. Great. And I, yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to get on time then. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I definitely agree with you that when you look at the kind of later life space mm. um, and how to converse with those clients, it's completely different, I yeah. guess, because my main take from the switch over from standard lending into equity lease when I did it was you've got mortgage people who are coming for a standard mortgage want it done yesterday don't they they're like oh, oh, yeah. and urgently need this through and it's yeah. all very busy 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 quick 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 whereas actually the minute you go into the later life lending space it's a completely different almost different time scales isn't it and so yeah. how did you find that yeah i mean i think my later life clients they have the life experience to go with it you know if you remember back to perhaps with you bought your first home it's really stressful isn't it you know you've got all these things that are going on all these things are happening and you kind of have to try and decipher what everyone's saying and, and unless you've got a good broker behind you sometimes that can be really difficult because brokers are often the glue that kind of seals it all together um whereas i think later life clients they're less concerned about the process in a sense of you know they've been through this before they've bought houses in the past and slowing that process down, I think, is actually the right way to go about it because it means that, you know, ultimately the advice that you give is more considered because they've had more time to kind of, you know, think about the things that you've been talking about, make sure they're really happy and comfortable. And, you know, vulnerabilities and things like that, they are more prevalent in later life lending. There are more vulnerable clients, I think it's fair to say, in the later life space. So, you know, the fact that you're not always up against it to deliver within this really, you know, predetermined time scale that might have been set by an estate agent or a solicitor or what have you, it just gives you more time to understand that client. And I think that is the most important thing because it's not as transactional as you may find like the more mainstream mortgage market is, in my opinion. So I was going to say, do you find that particular clients, if you like, sometimes have been mulling over the idea of going, you know, doing some sort of later life lending when they, before they come to it? Yeah, I think that you know most of the time when you're dealing with the mainstream market, they've come to you because this is what I'm doing. And unfortunately, sometimes it even gets to a point where they've already decided this is what they're doing before they actually know they can. I find in the later life space, clients are more considered they have thought about their options um and that always then opens the conversation up to talk about those alternatives as well because you know when you're considering what's best for your client it's not just about the borrowing op options that are out there sometimes it's the non-borrowing opportunities actually that are more 
they're, they're a better outcome for the client. So, you know, they may have already thought about the possibility of downsizing to raise some capital. They may have considered, um, I don't know, perhaps a further advance with their current lender. Maybe they have a mortgage left over at the moment. There's all these different things that they're probably mulling around in their head and they have done for some time. So when you get the opportunity to kind of get into that conversation and into that dialogue, you know, my first port of call really is to establish what have you already done? Because we need to work out where you are now to then how I'm going to advise you going forward. So I definitely think there's more consideration when um, older clients are thinking about you know, their borrowing options. And there's a lot going on, isn't there, for mm. them? You know, they're thinking about care, you know, care provisions going forward, yeah. thinking about what they want to happen to the home if one of them was no longer there, the risk of that. It's it's a huge, obviously, you think about that in a standard mortgage, but I guess in the, the later life space, it's far more prevalent to them, isn't it? Because they're closer and closer to that time of life of... Yeah potentially having some huge changes in the home, such as one of them needing care, one of them potentially passing away. And it's it's a completely different nuance in the conversation, isn't it? Yeah, I find, I mean, and the point around, you know, one of the borrowers passing away, I appreciate this is all, you know, these things aren't pre- predetermined. They, you know, they happen when they happen. But there is more consideration. And quite often, one of the, one of the things that I'm asked the most is, what happens if my partner passes away? What happens if my spouse passes away? You know, they're, they're more concerned about the person that they'll leave behind than what would happen if it happened to them almost, you know? And um, obviously, with things like lifetime mortgages, that's not so much of an issue because actually that guarantee of tenure is there. Um, and that differs from some of the other later life lending options or even your conventional mortgage options. You know, there are lenders in the conventional space that will lend into clients' 70s, sometimes 80s, that don't necessarily make provision for what if one of those incomes disappears. And in you know, in this day and age, when we look at the, the typical pension provision, we're still in a place where one party's pension provision will die with them. So, you know, the whole point of affordability and checking affordability, yes, it's a, a good thing. And by checking affordability, you're making sure that mortgage is affordable now and in the future. But I think sometimes the lenders, um, the lenders models may be a little bit not not quite you know um what's the word i'm looking for they don't quite d- dive deep enough yeah it's not quite deep dive enough for purpose yeah. for that individual sometimes is it this to is then it. think about their risk and the things happening because i'm in the retirement space now and mm. i work in our annuities uh, space and we're definitely um seeing that as more and more people have less income as they reach that yeah. that point more and more people are wanting stability yeah. later in life than maybe what they had in the past yeah. when we look at typical you know mortgages and drawdown so we're we're seeing um we've had a case recently where there's been a somebody approaching to do equity release yeah. but they're using it to buy a care annuity so then it's like those two products working really together to provide that stability whereas yeah. if you went to a mainstream kind of lender or didn't come to an advisor for that mm-hmm. you, that's maybe a potential opportunity missed you know, for that client and it's really actually really interesting that you say that because i think you know as we as as the later life market evolves and we start to see you know some of the innovation that's coming from products and also the kind of the crossover between um pension provision and borrowing into retirement there really needs to be I think like you know that that joined up approach is becoming more important than it perhaps ever has been because when you're thinking about a later life lending option it would be so wrong of you to not consider how that might impact you know pensionable income how that might impact intergenerational transfer of wealth that kind of thing you know there's all these different things that I think and, and some of the ways that the industry is changing now as well as I think people are starting to think about the kind of more rounded package rather than just equity release, which is always the first thing that when people talk about later life comes to mind, this is this product that does this and that. I think that when we think about how to ensure that our older borrowers are protected and, and even just our older clients across the board, these are all kind of tools in your box. And I think that advisors as a whole probably need to consider those things more now than perhaps they might have done five years ago when interest rates were kind of that much lower and you know when when there was that kind of stability in the market and the product was there and being used because it was seen as kind of cheap um we're not necessarily in that space anymore and i think that you know having that kind of overarching thought point of i need to make sure that all these needs are covered rather than just focusing on my client wants to release twenty thousand pounds to buy a new car. You know, you've got to think that much further ahead now. It takes it away from being a transaction, doesn't it? And it makes it like a a, a really um, sound 
kind of almost life coaching for the customer when it comes to finances <laughs> and what they can do and things. So you do like become sometimes. a bit of an agony <laughs> sometimes, don't you? You yeah, do. I think you do. And, and, you know, pe- people are in this position. They often, they've come to you because they trust you. Um, and the last thing you want to do is kind of break down that trust. So you have to think about those wider those wider issues is not just about ensuring that you are able to satisfy the need it's what are the implications of, of my recommendation and how are they going to affect this client over this lifetime um which isn't predetermined you know you set up a, a, a mortgage for 30 years you know that if that client doesn't do anything with it in 30 years time they would have paid their loan off that's great um lifetime mortgages you know the entry point now at 55 there's no set date there it could go on forever um and you know, you've got to make sure that you're 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 staying there. You're not just there at the time when you set it up. It's all about, you know, how are we making sure that this client is is looked after for for the rest of their life? And I've just just it's just such an important part of it. We're very passionate about it. So Absolutely. So tell you really care and how you mentioned the market's changed. Obviously, we all know that you know um, I work in annuities. It's been great yeah. for me the yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. the interest rates, but obviously for for yourself in that um, environment. How have you had to adapt your approach or have you had to adapt your approach? How have you managed to get clients in a period of low, you know, those rates being a bit higher, the payments not being, as you said, as cheap as they once were? I think that, you know, as a whole, the the days of I want to buy something because it's cheap, just that we're just not there anymore. I think when I speak to my clients about later life lending as a whole entity, it's about what this is going to do for them. So I don't necessarily think that my approach has changed. It's just obviously that it's going to cost potentially a little bit more in the way of interest if they're allowing it to roll up or if they're going to service it, the payments are going to be higher. But you know the need is still there. Um, and I think people are, and going back to the question you asked about, um, you know, do are, are people kind of mulling things over? Yes, they absolutely are. Uh, and this is, I think, the result of that is that when we finally get to a position where a client has built up the trust, perhaps you've spoken to them over the course of two or three meetings, and you, you, they then come to you and said, right, you know, I think it's time now. You've you've had that period of them building up to it, but also then you're just able to kind of look at all of those options and and be in a position where. You know, you like I said, you can be more considered, and you can look at all of the avenues before you eventually decide on which way you're going to go. Because they're more considered, they the fact you mentioned that some of them are asking around those eventualities, the what ifs. It sounds like unlike you know we talk to a lot of protection advisors and stuff, and you're talking mm-hmm. to customers around the what if scenarios. Yeah, it sounds like customers are thinking about that anyway. They're already asking you, and that's where you it, your your knowledge, your skill, your yeah. expertise comes to the fore because you can explain about that wider impact on their portfolio, like you say, the intergenerational generational planning, all that yeah. type of thing. Yeah, and, and and that's it, isn't it? Because like I say, when when you're talking to first time buyers about protecting their mortgage. Um, you know, sometimes that can be met with with some objection, which is bonkers, isn't it? Because you know they've potentially got a ninety percent LTV loan, um, and their employment income, which is never guaranteed, is the only thing that's supporting that loan, and they're quite flippant almost as to say, well, why do I need this? Whereas, you know, clients that have been through this journey already, and they've you know, they've they've seen home ownership, they might have suffered loss in their family. You know, they've got to their fifties, they're in a position where perhaps they they they're looking towards retirement they can or can't at that moment in time you know, sometimes is yet to be seen um but they you know all these things they've experienced already so they know the questions that they want to ask you they're not worried about what if i don't get this mortgage mm-hmm. because actually what's more important to them is making sure they get the right thing um so they you know again they're what they slow things down uh, and you know my style is very much to make sure that my clients are well supported and they're at a position where they're they're almost telling me where what route we need to take because I've been able to spend that time to go for all those options with them and then we can together draw a conclusion on what is the best route for you. Yeah, it feels like a consultative style, doesn't it? Yeah, Very absolutely. laid back, if you like, for one of a better way of describing it. Yeah. And, and you've got, I suppose, with, with those particular customers, do, do you have any scenarios where over a period of time where they've moulded it over and they might have ended up at a decision they're going to, you know, the path they're going to take, one is more pro doing something from in the later life spending uh, spend, lending space than, than the other do you mean what as far as which which solution that they'd like yeah. they ultimately want you, to take yeah um yeah. yeah i mean sometimes and and what's really really interesting is that you know equity release as a term is is yeah. you know people assume oh this is going to mean this and that for me um and quite often when i'm when i'm 
kind of you know that consultative style as you've mentioned when i'm talking to clients about their options a lifetime mortgage could be option three or option four on the things of on, on in terms of priorities that could be like the fourth thing on the list as to what what they could do to um to 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 fulfill that need um, and quite often when you talk through the pros and the cons of for example, the, the the capital and interest mortgage the retirement interest only mortgage what about hybrid what about ptlm you know what about downsizing you know it's it's number five on the list but actually when you talk through the pros and cons and what that means to that client and that particular space if they're mandated to service their interest versus the opportunity to be flexible in that approach they still end up thinking, well, actually, do you know what? This lifetime mortgage, it has, you know, all the benefits of, of security of tenure. If my situation changes, if one of us does pass on, I'm not going to be in a position where I'm committed to continue to make these payments because no one really knows how a bereavement is going to affect them until they're there. Um, you know, you may want to downsize. Well, you know, the, the three-year compassionate um, redemption windows there. Like, you know, there's, there's options, you know, lifetime mortgages are actually really well thought out. Uh, and I think that it's all these other little features that that are often overlooked. You know, clients are very quick to go, well, what's this going to cost me? And that is what it is. No one can can change that. It's all the other things that these the lifetime mortgages do that can actually make up the basis of a recommendation for a lifetime mortgage over a capital and interest or a or a REA. And you're right to, to flag the fact that, you know, we talk about it a lot when life happens. If someone is bereaved, they could be thinking very, very differently, as Absolutely. you mentioned, uh, about things than they were before. Yeah. So they could have had I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years in that particular property when they were with their partner or spouse or whatever. Mm. The, the, one of the last things they may want to do when they get there, I suppose when you're young, take the mortgage, oh yeah, build up, get a big property, I'll just downsize. Then yeah. you get there, think, oh, I don't really think I really want to do that. The kids grew up in the house or whatever, and uh, I just don't really want the rigmarole of it, so I'm not going to do it. But yeah. again, things may change if someone dies. So I think you're right to highlight the fact that we've got this flexibility in these types of products. It is, it's very forward thinking and very customer focused. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, with that, if you think about your typical first time buyer again to go back to first time buyers sorry first time buyers but you know you have a, a, a predetermined term you have a protection policy that um that pays out on the event of a, of a bereavement or a quick illness or what have you um you know, from an advisor's perspective who works in that market if that eventuality comes about the protection that's been set up to ensure that risk pays out and then potentially they're not your client anymore because what you and they initially came to you for of I'm going to come to you because you're going to arrange a mortgage for me, that relationship's ended because you know they've suffered that bereavement, they've or they've had a critical illness, it's paid their mortgage off, they're not in a position where you need to service them anymore. Whereas with a lifetime mortgage, you know, you are that client's advisor for the rest of their life. I'm quite fortunate that in touch word, I'm going to be in that position um, where I can I can speak to those clients and speak to those clients' children um, because I'm going to be there. And you know, just because something has happened in their in their family situation, the relationship doesn't end because you know, more often than not, a lifetime mortgage isn't protected in the same way because of the the way that you can forego making interest payments and allow it to roll up. Protection isn't there to repay the debt, so you're still there servicing that client or the you know the 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 bereaved client um, at the point where um, mm. you know where they really need you and the process means that you will get in contact with the family anyway You're in, the family are involved aren't yeah, they this so is you're it. already there with them mm -hmm. and, and in terms of that regular contact then how does that work for, for, for your later life lending clients how do you keep in contact how do you keep that awareness going about what you're you're doing as an advisor and as a brand it's 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 a 12 monthly thing for us so I mean I, I'm checking in with my clients every year just yeah. to sort of say how are things going you know what's changed what's new did you buy that boat what one did he get? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, that doesn't happen as much anymore as it perhaps did a few years ago, in fairness. Yeah. But, you know, um, it is, it's an ongoing its an ongoing journey. Um, it, it sounds really corny, but you almost want to become part of that family dynamic. You know, you've already met the, you've already met the kids. You've, you've been around to see the client and you've seen the grandkids pictures on the wall. And, you know, you know, these people, they are, um, they are people that you spend some time with likely because they have been considering their options. So you've not just turned up at a mortgage appointment like you may do in the mainstream service that client's need and kind of move on it is very much like a journey and you know th there's always that continuation of that and you know it'd be wrong of me to recommend a product for someone's lifetime and then not be there to make sure that product remains suitable for them and that's obviously where consumer duty is highlighting um that these kind of regular contact points need to be you know need to be made but i think any advisor that is thinking about 
their clients in the long term are probably doing this already just as part of their normal day-to-day work. Yeah, it's so important, isn't it? Because what I find interesting about the later life space is we call it a lifetime mortgage, which yeah. maybe makes people think it's not flexible. So yeah. I guess yeah. that's it's interesting. There are all these little options, and um, you know, throughout that product, it actually is an advisor you can continue to add value to what you do. You mentioned something when we caught up um, last time. So I think some advisors listening to the call would be thinking, or listening to this podcast, sorry, would be thinking, I really like it to release i really want to get into it or want to be able to refer it yeah but i don't know where to start with my client bank Mm -hmm. what would you say are the things for them to look out for you know if they're doing standard mortgages at the moment Mm -hmm. and actually maybe they do have some clients coming up to 50 years old what would you say are the key things for them to look out for you know if they've got a client bank they've got people in their approaching 50 or getting you know products now can start from 50 sure what would you say they should look out for? Well, I think that's exactly it, isn't it? Because, you know, later life, 50 isn't actually later life. You know, the way that um, the way that technology is coming on, people are living a lot longer. There is a good chance. I mean, you know, 18 is the entry point as a minimum for a mortgage. Is it fair to say that age 50 is later life? Well, it is, for a lot of people, that's only halfway through the, the time they've been able to borrow money. So it is earlier. And I think any, any mortgage broker who doesn't do... Uh, equity release as a product offering at the moment are probably in a really, really great position to start to do that because the way that lenders are innovating their products now and they're starting to look more at affordability and you know how much would would be affordable for your client to pay or let's look at a way of you know being able to extend what can be borrowed using earned income or pension income you know kind of mortgage brokers who who operate in that mainstream mortgage market already they do that now this is this is their this is their bread and butter. This is their everyday work. Um, you know, a lifetime mortgage, or equity release, is is kind of quite fast becoming an extension of what's available in the mainstream. And, and obviously, these kind of more flexible um, products that are out there help to kind of bridge that gap almost. So, I think anyone who who isn't qualified to give um, equity release advice at the moment is, is is probably in a good place because like I say they know half of what the job is becoming um, the other half is obviously the considerations of how do I deal with an older client what things will I come up against that I might not come up against in the, the more kind of residential mortgage space like what happens if one of your clients passes away how does that wealth pass down to to children to grandchildren etc so there are you know there are obviously some some complications with with that with the sector um, but you know the whole concept of affordability and and thinking about how can I put my client in the best position using the income that they have to support their loan. That's that's where we're heading. It feels, and that's a really nice way to put it, isn't it? It's like how can I best support with the income they have? Because that's the thing; their income's about to be probably changing quite a bit throughout that time. And this is it. you know, regular mortgage might no longer be fit for purpose. Those hybrid products, you know, our PTL, that's exactly where they come into their own, isn't yeah. it? And and having knowledge of those can really change a customer's life and they they run up to retirement yeah. by freeing up income and can't it exactly yeah and there is an element of of desire and there is an element of what the client wants as well so i mean this week i've i've um written two mortgages for two different clients who are the same age but they have two different types of mortgage similar incomes and it's because their their kind of outlook on life is different one um one client i've recommended a capital and interest mortgage for over a predetermined period because they want to know that they can repay their mortgage before they retire which is fine um and the other client i've recommended a retirement interest only mortgage because actually the the point of repaying their capital and their family dynamic isn't as important Mm -hmm. as it is for the other client so you know just because you have a set of numbers in front of you and a a profile of a client the fact finding and the work that you do as an advisor to to dig deep into what motivates them that's ultimately what spares your recommendation on um so there is that extra kind of added point to it and that added skill to it um but you know the 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 numbers bit, um, the bit that you know you spend hours looking at, working. Well, who can I do this with? Or who can they? you know? We've all been there. We've all done that. The the next step on is then how you kind of garner that relationship and, and ultimately recommend what's right for that client in the here and now. It's the value that you've shown there, isn't it? The, yeah. the, the value that you're showing with regards to getting to know that client. Yeah. The whys and wherefores, how they feel about things, the challenges they've had. It's all about contributes to their psyche and their makeup and the way they are, doesn't it? So yeah. therefore you're the, providing an appropriate recommendation based 
on what they want, what the outcome is. Again, the consumer, yeah. you, you, you mentioned earlier on, they understand what they're going into mm -hmm. and you're there all the way through to ensure that they're getting a, a proper positive outcome. Yeah, it's, you know, we, we are advisors. We're not just here, here to, to take a profile. It's not like doing your exams again and going, if only I could ask this one more question, <laughs> I would know what to recommend. You know, we've got the beauty of doing that now because we're with clients, we're sat with them, talking to them every day, sometimes digging a little bit deeper and asking those couple of questions about them rather than their finances. That can ultimately change change the route or the path that you may have thought you were going down. So yeah, it's 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 for me, it's fantastic to be in a position where whatever client sits in front of me, I have a potential solution for them. The, the great and the, the kind of the exciting bit sometimes is finding out which one we're going for. You know. And you mentioned family quite a few times. So we know the Equity Lease Council really recommend that family should be involved it, right from yeah. the outset because ultimately they'll be dealing with it all when you know that customer is no longer there anymore. Yeah. You mentioned uh, when we spoke previously a really clever kind of way that you market out to clients and kind of you look at potential when you think about your standard marketing, you don't just market to those over 55. So do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? And so, that yeah, means? I mean, yeah, it's, it's perhaps a little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, equity release is just a mortgage. It's an interest only mortgage that can run for the rest of your life and you decide if you pay it or not. That is bold to say, but that that kind of is what it is. Um, and, you know, even in the in the kind of the, the, the normal market, the, the typical mortgage market, interest only mortgages are still available. So the fact that they can have this type of product isn't necessarily wholly exclusive to later life. And, you know, the great thing in the position that I'm in is that I do speak to younger clients as well. You know, I, I work across the whole market, so I can I can um, do more or less anything in the, in the lending sense. But it is just an interest only mortgage that you can, you can take for the rest of your life. You don't have to. You can, like all mortgages, you can repay it. You don't have to make payments. If you do, that will benefit your estate. If you don't, then that interest is still going to be charged. It's just going to be added onto the loan. Um, it's not dissimilar from what you what you get in the in the normal conventional mortgage market. Um, you know, my my typical client is between the ages fifty five and seventy. They have an interest only mortgage that is due to expire even now or in the next twelve months. Um, they're fully aware of how an interest only mortgage works because they have one already. Um, and sometimes, in the right scenarios, a lifetime mortgage is almost an extension of that interest only arrangement because they are comfortable with the premise of paying interest on a regular basis, which in turn means that that will prevent any compounding interest over time, which will ultimately help to preserve their estate. And I suppose the great thing now is that lenders are much more flexible in terms of what you can do with your payments. So you don't just, you know, you don't have to stop at just servicing interest. You can pay off a lifetime mortgage over a period of time using your overpayment allowance. So, you know, these are all features that clients who are who are in the who are not in the later life lending um market shall we say they're used to having access to these features already um and the fact that now the industry is more aligned with the, the traditional mortgage market it just means that when you're talking to clients about how they can impact the decision that they're making now they, they relate to it and it they you know these are things that they can already do um and then the, i suppose the big thing from that is making sure that with the regular follow-ups that you do with clients that they if they are in a position to be able to do that that they take advantage of those features yeah. and do you find that they do take advantage of it so i just when i was advising even actually um a family family members of mine recently actually looked at doing later life lending and and what we found with them is I was trying to explain to them that if you do a lifetime mortgage, you can still have optional payments, which will keep the balance the exact same. It gives you options, etc. cetera. Um, but they were adamant that they didn't want to look at an equity through, that retirement interest only yeah. was the way to go. And it was stick because they still didn't quite trust the equity release products are, yeah. you know, are, yeah. are good for consumers. Do you still see some of that happening? And how do you get around it? I think, yes, I do. Mm. Um, it would be wrong of me to sit here and say that every every client is not, you know, is tuned on to the, the, the concept of equity release because 
you know, it doesn't have a great reputation. There were times where X2 Relief was a, was a lot more restrictive, that there were these limitations on what you could and couldn't do. And there, there's still a hangover, if you like, in the industry of, of those times. We're, st- you know, we're still kind of riding that and, and dealing with that as advisors to educate our clients on the, the upshots and some of the benefits that, that come with it. Um, you know, last week, I went and saw a client post completion um, to set up the standing order with them, and I think it all stems from how you manage that client's relationship. Um, you know, my client last week that I went to see, we discussed the impact of what happens if you don't make those interest payments over time. I also illustrated to them the benefit of them making those payments over time. Um, they were happy that if in the future their situation changed and perhaps they couldn't afford it, we don't know what's going to happen with cost of living, we don't know what's going to happen with, you know, with anything is is also um, so changeable right now. Um, so for them, as opposed to the retirement interest only mortgage where they have been mandated to make those payments, they are actually you know safe in the knowledge that if their situation were to change massively and perhaps they needed some, I don't know, um, someone to come in and help with things like household task care, they're not then going to feel like they can't spend their money on that because they can reduce down what they pay on their lifetime mortgage. And, you know, through regular follow-up, you make sure that your client is 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 in the loop and they know where they stand with what they can and can't do. So, again, I think it just all goes back to the, really the relationship. Isn't it? Because as you get older, you just worry. That's human nature. You worry more and more about everything, don't you? So you can imagine as you're going to something new again, <laughs> the change curve, oh, I'm going to worry about this. Yeah. What if? What if we, the income you know, reduces or, or whatever? What do we do? So it, it, it sounds like your role, even that post-completion mm. point, has still got that that real level of... of, of of crucialness with regards to the pathway which they've taken the, you know it's funny how we you know when we think about mortgage advice you know it's always considered to be this kind of one tiny little bit in the process and the time that you spend with your client but actually the advice you give your client is for every single interaction that you have with them because you're always educating you're always trying to ensure that they're their best interests are at heart, that you're trying to do the right things for your clients. You do that every time you pick up the phone to them, every time you you meet them for for lunch or whatever you do with your clients, you know, you're always advising them on what is best for them. Um, It doesn't just stem from the time where they signed a bit of paper to say that that's the recommendation that they've accepted. It is a lifelong You're topping up that trust, aren't you? Yeah. Every time, that each touch point that you have, galvanizing it or however you want to describe it absolutely yeah and and often those those kind of follow-up meetings and, and those opportunities to re-engage with a client it, it's another it's another kind of introduction to their family and you know thinking about thinking about it from a commercial standpoint you know once i'm building relationships with with their family members you know i then have a a, a potential new client so it's not just about you know if you're thinking about how can i grow my business and how can i ensure that i'm helping as many clients as i can you know all of the op- all of the the interactions that you have with your client can ultimately stem and lead to further interactions with their family and you know if i was recommended to someone by their mum i would be making sure that i'm absolutely you know top notch service that client because if someone's mum's recommended me you know what i mean like that almost feels like i mean i've got kids myself you know like that almost feels like oh, i need to make sure i'm on my a game here because this is this is Joey's mum that's recommended me. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, they, yeah. they will tell their friends as well, won't yeah. they? And if you're keeping in contact with them so much, like you're doing, yeah. it's the old saying, wasn't it? You know, if you get amazing service, you'll tell your friends. If you yeah. get really bad service, you'll tell yeah. your friends. If it's mediocre, you're not really going to say. Yeah, and, and that's what you want, don't you? you? Want them to be as as energetic as you are yeah. about the solution you've provided, particularly if you've got people as Hazel's already mentioned that may have heard about equity release, heard all the bad stories back in the day, and go, oh, yeah. we we'll touch that type thing, and they might be saying, well, no, actually. You know, I went through it with Mike, and he did this, 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 and this, and and potentially, you know, you've got new clients. With you. And and even if equity release or a lifetime mortgage isn't the right option for that client, the great thing about working in in this kind of later life industry and working across all these different products is that there is always something that and there's always a tool in the box. There's always something that I can use and something that I can help a client with. And um, the big the big question, the big thing that is on everyone's mind is, do I trust the guy that's sat in front of me? 
to do the right thing for me. And I think, you know, we, I pride myself on, on working with the whole market. I think that's really, really important um, because actually that encourages innovation in the market, that encourages providers to really be on their A game and make sure that they're attracting advisors' business, which is a great result for the client because it means that they've got more flexibility. They've got the, you know, as far as the, the cost of their borrowing, it's, it's competitively priced, it's, it's priced in line with the market, um, and they've got all these cool features that they can use as well. And you know, if you think think further ahead than just equity release, all of this stuff is already out there. The big shame in all of it is that um, our demographic is still very, very, um, they're, they're not inclined to to inquire. They're not inclined to ask these questions because they're worried about, you know, the, the, the possibility of ending up with equity release where, again, you know, the stuff we've spoken about over the last 45 minutes or so, is all around flexibility and how there's so many uh, there's so many options for clients now and what they can and can't do with the borrowing that they take. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you're drilled in, even when you very first go to a mortgage advisor as a first time buyer, they drill into you, try and get the term nice and short so you can pay mm-hmm. your mortgage off as quick as you can, so you can be debt free to enjoy retirement. Yeah. So it's almost like drilled into you from a very young age in your house buying process that oh, it's bad to have a mortgage mm-hmm. as I get older. I want to get rid of that. I want to get so. I guess as generations change and people are taking out their mortgages later and later. Actually, that's where it actually comes into its own, doesn't it? Because you then, that reputation is getting yeah. small, you know, that it's kind of getting dulled down, isn't it, over time? And, and that's only yeah. positive as people live longer and, and will have even more needs for those yeah. those products. And the group and the group of people that need it is growing as well. You know, obviously we're looking at, as, as an industry, you know, the way, the speed in which interest only mortgages are, you know, these maturities are happening. Um, so there are more clients out there now that need a solution that will take them into their retirement. Um, you know, there are um, some mainstream lenders that that do their best to plug the gap, but then they're just not set up for lending on a CNI basis for the rest of people's days. That's not for them. That's not the business that they do. So you know, lifetime mortgage lenders and and um, lenders that are willing to perhaps be a little bit more specialist and, and do later life lending, you know, they have a different outlook on the way that they operate. But it just means then that your clients, they're, they're somewhere for them. They're not just stuck like they potentially have been in the in the past. Um, and what's really interesting is the, the, you know, the kind of the hybrid products and the, the payment term product, you know, all of these innovations that are coming to market, it feels like they are designed for the benefit of those types of borrower who can't under the traditional equity lease attain the loan to value that they need and the fact that their lenders are actually out there looking to increase their offering which i guess in turn increases their market share you know that's great business for them it means that my clients have got a home um and they don't have to leave their home you know like that's that's a win-win-win isn't it right you know everyone kind of benefits from that um and that is again that's one of the things that if client if if the kind of the general consensus was that later life lending is a good thing that i think that message would be so much better heard but it's still sometimes you do find that you're in a position where you're almost having to defend why someone who is in their 50s will borrow money for the rest of their lives but it's already happening you know the great thing is is that now we've got solutions for it and a lot of people don't have a choice do they the way that pensions and things are and and they you know Way that rates have been that'll have shocked some people. People could have been getting to the end of their mortgage, or they had a couple of more fixed, mm. fixed rates to maybe lock into. Rates have completely changed. So throwing that whole yeah. timeline for them absolutely off, won't it? And I think it's that's where again, it's so important. What I'm curious about. So obviously, whole of market is really important to you, obviously, yeah. and to be able to provide your clients with that holistic approach is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm thinking if some advisors are listening to this, they might think, how on earth does Mike remember? How does he keep his, uh, how do you stay ahead of all these changes? And what do you do in terms of self-development, self-learning? I think that's all everything that you do, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. You know, the time that I'm not spent speaking to clients is time where I'm trying to further enhance my knowledge of, of the subject. Um, you know, it's funny, isn't it? Because actually in the in the kind of the later life space, there are considerably less lenders than perhaps the mainstream mortgage market. Mm-hmm. Um, when I joined Mewstone um, back at the early part of this year, I started initially to take on some kind of general mainstream mortgage clients. And it was a nightmare. Honestly, it was so... Because there are some real, real technical things that you do. Um, and when you come out of that market and then you go back into it, it is, you know, you've got to kind of 
put yourself back in there and remember, well, who does this and who does that? So you could argue that in the later life space, there is a considerably, you know, there is a much smaller population of lenders out there that do it. But because the products are so complicated, you know, it only takes one small criteria change and all of a sudden, you know, you're kind of your go-to for this or that is they're gone. So you have got to keep yourself in the loop all the time. Um, and, and that just comes from engaging with, engaging with the industry you know we i heard a term from another advisor that, that i speak to regularly and he referred to the later life um market as a village and i it stuck with me actually because it is it is a really small village of, of people you know some people are lenders some some of the people that live in the village are advisors and some of the people that live in the village are consumers it is a, it is a small village and you know you have to kind of build those relationships with your neighbors to get to a point where you're on top of what they offer and what they do. Um, because, you know, everyone's unique. All lenders have got different attitudes to risk. They've got different reasons why they're in the market. And, you know, once you understand what makes them work, I think sometimes then that helps you to know how they can benefit your clients. It's a village probably sat in between two big cities of yeah. mortgages, <laughs> standard mortgages, and in retirement, wealth planning. Yeah, yeah, You're that bridge kind of in the middle, aren't you? Because you've got to know about standard mortgage, enough about standard mortgages mm. to be able to say to a client, you might be better placed there, go and have a look. But you also need to, you know, using that annuity case as an example, mm. you need to know enough about actually what's available in the retirement space as a whole and the wealth planning and that yeah. intergenerational wealth and risk of, you know, inheritance that all those things so it's a lot yeah. to take in isn't it and be knowledgeable yeah. on and i think you know my my personal aspiration for the next 12 months is to become um dip for qualified and i think that in in this market and in this industry you know, it's all about ensuring right outcomes consumer duty has really really highlighted that to us um and you know to, to better my advice i think that's my kind of logical next step because then like you said it means that i can commute across to the city over here that deals with pensions and, and investments and so on and so forth but still you know kind of have some some kind of some honor to to the city that i've left behind which was which was kind of you know more mainstream residential mortgages so i think that you know as this as this concept of later life lending and, and how you protect intergenerational wealth, how you are able to do things like get children onto the ladder, all of that stuff, you know, you have to be thinking about what's going on over here as well as what's going on over there whilst trying to stay in your village as well. So, yeah, like, you know, it, it is all very, very in, like, closely interlinked now. And the village will only grow with the innovation by reference well, to anyway. They tend to get, you know, they, that's what tends to happen, isn't it? You know, they tend to become a part of a bigger city and, and that, you know, could well be that over the over the you know the next five or ten years um as this becomes more commonplace and people are more um you know people are using like later life options more and more to pay their mortgages off or help their children a ladder or whatever the situation may be you know as the as the town grows <laughs> you know more and more people are going to live there aren't they because the stuff that 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 place offers is is good and and it, and it just grows in there their dream lifestyle, isn't it? <laughs> well, whether it's lifestyle or, well, I guess later life lending is two extremes, isn't it? It's either the lifestyle, the, you know, as you said, some one of your clients buying a boat. I had one that bought a Bentley one time, and you yeah. just think it's, but then you also have the clients who really need it. And yeah. they're the really financially vulnerable and, and need your help. So it's a lovely way that actually you've seen a full breadth of of society yeah and there's there's different feelings as well you know when you when you've you've got someone the keys to that car or whatever they you know that aspiration that they want to achieve it's a really great feeling because you've helped them achieve something um and it doesn't go away from you like it's still great that you've put them in a position where they can do that but you know when you've been able to help someone stay in the property that they inherited from their nan or something like that you know actually that that's got a, a whole different feeling to it um and if these options went out there, that wouldn't be possible. That client would have to downsize. Um, you know, for some people it is just bricks and mortar and that's fine. But it is for some for others it is their life, you know, that is where they've always been and they're not ready to go yet. So for any advisors listening, also we've covered a, an amazing amount of topics there about kind of self learning, yeah. looking at um, you know, vulnerability, how to build trust in your clients, your process. What would be the thing that was your key takeaway from being in this, this industry that you would advise to others? I think be curious, like go out and find out what you can and can't do. You know, what 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 what's on offer, what's out there. Um the village thing again it's 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 not a, like a closed community it's not uh 
oh, you know, I can't go and ask this, I can't go and do that. Like I speak to brokers all the time who who ask me questions about, you know, well, I've got this this client who's perhaps a little bit, you know, I assume I can't do anything. It's like this almost like I assume it's not going to happen. And the, but that's just the polar opposite of where we are. Um, so just be curious, find, ask the questions, go and speak to other brokers, you know, set up communities, um, engage with other professionals in this industry because we can all, you know, collectively, everyone's got a specialism, you know, everyone, everyone is good at something. Um, and there's no reason why anyone that's kind of worth their salt won't be willing to help and share that because ultimately the more people that work in this industry, I think the more it could strength, it strengthens the reputation. Um, and then that means that client outcomes are improved. So that for me is like the big thing. Yeah. And that's where you started, wasn't it? Yeah. Like the very this conversation started that your clients at Building Society that yeah. you like, you know, that you warm to and like yeah. dealing with. It's exactly. Being soon. curious at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just one particular thing that has resonated with me today, in particular, around that building trust with clients and stuff, is where if every advisor could sit and think, a clients when they're sitting in front of them for the first time, building that relationship with them. They're going to be thinking, is that person really putting me at the centre of what they're doing? Have they got my best interests at heart? Are they really going to see things through mm. and be there when I need them? And and I just thought that was so powerful. Yeah. And if everyone could be thinking that, and, and a lot of advisors do actually, but to keep that sort of top of mind when you're first meeting your clients, that could really, really um, help everyone going forward. Yeah, and you know, like ultimately, if I help a client buy their first home because, like I said, I still work in that market as well there's no reason why I can't continue to service that client for the rest of, of my lifetime. And, and, you know, personally looking at where I, where I aspire to be, you know, for, again, if we go back to how that could affect me on a commercial level, if I can arrange a mortgage for a client who, which then moves into later life lending, which looks at pension. So actually, you know, by working hard at those, those first time buyer clients and those clients that are perhaps new to, to the world of financial advice, if you're if you do everything in your power to make sure that you give that client the best you can there's no reason why you can't do that then for those other things in their later life as well it's a journey isn't it you know and i think the best impression that you make at the very start of that journey the more likely you are then to build that trust and be able to continue that relationship through to you know everything else that applies absolutely fantastic well, Thank you so much for your time. No worries. It's been Thank lovely you. speaking to you. Thank and you. Before we close, I'd just like wish you the very best of luck if you take on Dipfa. Thank Good you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure yeah. there'll be many people listening that can lend a hand. So, I'll be uh, here in 12 months. Yeah. I'm Good looking tired, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thanks. No worries. Thank you.